All right. So this week, Seth is joining us again from Germany. But uh, that's the last week, right? Yep. I'm leaving for the U.S. tomorrow. Today in Berlin. Excited? Yeah. It'll be nice to sleep in my own bed for once. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for me, if uh, I sound a little bit weird, is because I am very sick right now. I did catch something again uh, on my way to um, the Porsche on Wheeling in Niagara Falls. I'm feeling a little better today, but the last few days have been pretty rough. Uh, but I did get to see the Porsche Taken production version in person. And I was pretty impressed by the car, by the design. Uh, we knew that it was going to be toned down from the Mission E, and the Mission E was almost universally loved for its design. And it, you know what? It wasn't that much toned down. It was a little bit, for sure, but less so than I I, I, um, I thought it would be. Yeah, I, would, I wasn't able to see it live like you. Uh, for some reason, my uh, invitation in Berlin must have mm -hmm. got lost in the mail, which is okay because I got to go mm -hmm. for an extra day at the uh, bike show in um, Frederikshafen in the south of Germany. But um, from everything I saw, it is a beautiful car. Um, I don't know how it feels inside. I don't know how much room is inside. Um, I think they didn't show too much of that stuff. But We could uh, sit inside. We were able to sit inside. Yeah. Uh, how was it's, the back seat? Nah, not <laughs> great. Uh, yeah, if you're over six feet tall, it's um, it's not going to be an ideal situation to be on the back seat. Not roomy at all. It, I mean, look at the car from the exterior. It's extremely sleek looking. And the back is too. So uh, if you want to sit straight, your head's going <laughs> to hit the, um, the roof. But... It's very much a driver's car. Driver's seat, the passenger seat too is okay, like the same thing. But uh, f for that, the interior feels very luxurious. It looks a lot like, like uh, what we used to at Porsche. Of course, the version that they had there was the Turbo and the Turbo S, the two higher-end version of the car, which is what you're going to start with with the production. And uh, they, they only reveal the spec of those cars. We don't know the base spec um, that's going to come out later and probably next year. But that Turbo S, uh, you also have an optional passenger screen. So basically, you have like three screens that almost melt into one large screen from the dash, uh, the instrument cluster to the center dash, all the way to the passenger um, side. Very beautiful. They don't have much time to play with the uh, to to play with the the interface, the touchscreen interface. But the little time I had with wasn't super great at the responding time. The, it wasn't very responsive. It was almost reminiscent of uh, the Jaguar I-Pace um, interface that I complain a lot about. So I'm going to give them the benefit of doubt so, so far, but I'd like to spend more time with it to see if it, it's really as bad as I thought it would be. Because, but again, I, can, I cannot, like, don't quote me on that. Uh, I, I spent literally like 20 seconds on it. I spent more time about all the design feature on the exterior of the car. Got to see the front trunk for the first time. Uh, decent. Maybe not like Model S, Model X size, but more like Model 3. Maybe a little bit smarter than Model 3. Uh, the trunk. The trunk, uh, they did a pretty good job to optimize the trunk opening. I mean, it's not a hatchback. It's still like a, uh, what do you call that style that, uh, that you have on the Model, like the model 3? The trunk. Call? Just a regular, regular trunk opening, whatever. It is pretty. They optimize it on the sides and everything, so it's pretty large. But the actual volume uh, cargo space, eh, not that great either. There's a, a little second compartment that you can open. That's about big enough to fit uh, your uh, wall connector. Not much more than that. Wall connector is 11 kilowatts. That's good. I'm not sure it's standard though. Like. We're starting to look at the options and everything. That's where it gets crazy with the Titan. They go deep in the option, even like uh, DC fast charging, or at least the fast charging on the 800 volt system is an option. Uh, everything is an option, basically. So the price runs up pretty quick. Uh, and that price might have been the biggest surprise of the whole thing, because the specs probably had a good idea about, um, they're talking about 280 miles of range. 
though that's WLTP, so it's going to be a little bit shorter than that for the EPA. Though uh, they did release a new like a, a range testing, and the, it shows like 270 real world mileage that they had. So I don't know. They didn't release the speed they were driving that test. So anyway, you have um, the so the Turbo and Turbo S, and the Turbo start at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which was what we were expecting to like a fully equipped Taycan to be. But you don't have the top speed with the two point eight seconds acceleration. That uh, that's a new, that's the, also a new spec that came out. This week, uh, before that, Tekken was really like uh, not taken, but Porsche was just saying uh, faster than 3.5. Was saying more, much more than that. It's actually faster than three seconds. It's 2.8, uh, but that is with a Turbo S, which also has a slightly bigger wheels, a 22 inch, I think. Uh, and um, yeah, that that car starts at about $180,000 and you can run it up to over $200,000 with all the options. So it's not cheap. So yeah, if um, you put all that together, uh, sorry, are you still with me, Seth? Yep. Because I, I still, I see you like going in and out of the the, the thing. It's, uh, I think it's lagging a little bit. Anyway, the uh, kind of uh, inevitable comparison with the Mall S came out and if you just look at like a on paper spec for spec the Titan doesn't look good like at all I no, think you a, a it's actually surprisingly that. not good I thought mm-hmm. um, especially what we didn't really know much about the two gear uh, gearbox um, you would think with a gearbox like that it would have a you know with a lower gear it would have a, a better zero to 60 time um, it with a higher gear, it should also have a higher top speed. You would think um, both of those, uh, the Tesla Model S, the 100D from you know whatever, uh, is not better. almost Model S performance. Right, right, the, and with ludicrous mode, obviously with the uh, um, zero to sixty time. But it's just weird because with a gear like the whole point of a gearbox is to give you the ability to go zero to sixty faster with a low gear, and then with the high gear to go um, to a higher, higher top, top speed. speed. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what Remac is doing. Um, they want to beat the Roadster, so they put in a two-speed gearbox. Um, I believe the because Remac did that with the Concept 2, I think the Batista is going to have a two-speed gearbox because it's basically the same car inside. Um, so it was really surprising that Porsche didn't hit either of those benchmarks. Um, that Model S has has gotten. And then, you know, on top of that, the uh, Model S sedan with a, with a 100 uh, kilowatt hour engine uh, can go for 340 miles of range. Um, and it's a sedan. It's not like a low sports car. Uh, so it was surprising that Porsche didn't even hit 300 miles. Um, I, you know, I guess with the gearbox, maybe you lose some efficiency there, but it was... And also, Porsche has monster wheels, so um, that's going to not be great for uh, efficiency. Rolling resistance will be higher, um, but the car itself is quite uh, has a quite low drag coefficient. Um, it's is it's it lower on the ground than the Model. Yeah, and it's lower on the ground than the Model S. So uh, these numbers were a little confusing to me, and you know when when I kind of step, stepped away from it, and you know read about what people were saying on Twitter, it was like, you know, this is really hard for companies like Porsche and um, before Jaguar and Audi and everybody else because Tesla is so far out ahead in specs. And that's not that's not to say anything of the appearance of the Porsche. It's nothing to do with um, how it drives. But in, in terms of electric powertrain, Tesla is so far out ahead of the game that it's, you know, these Porsche in particular has always been kind of a specs driven thing. Like the, the 918 Spider has been like the fastest car ever off the line. Um, it just, you know, these zero to 60 times top speed, those kind of things are kind of what Porsche brags about when they, when they, you know, advertise their car. And at this point, like 
they can't say they're the fastest car and they're like the model the model s is a big sedan like you can't even beat a big sedan so it's it's a my the point of my story was that it's going to be hard for other ev makers to come in net and and kind of match tesla because they're so far ahead of the game in terms of those back but there's other ways to differentiate and i think porsche is is making an attempt to do that all right so can can you hear me yep okay because that shit c is really not doing a good job right now because okay. I, I look disconnected right now on the on the thing but yeah i agree with you for the most part but you, you brought up the the driving pleasure thing and uh I mean, if though, here's the way I see it. If someone is looking for the best electric car right now on the market, probably not the Taken. You should probably go with the Tesla. If you're looking for the best Porsche on the market, I think the Taken just became the best Porsche. Oh yeah, the flagship Porsche. Yeah. So if they did manage to. And what's the, that's what they claim to keep the Porsche soul with the Taycan, with the knowledge report train. Then if you're a Porsche fan looking to um, buy a new, a new Porsche, look at the Taycan. L- looks like, um, looks like it might be the best option right now if you want to buy a Porsche. So I think they're still going to find a, a decent diamond for it. Will it be the 40,000 number that they were throwing around um, in the past few months? Because originally they were talking about 20,000 units. I, I, th- I would thought that was already good for Porsche, which is a relatively small uh, automaker. Uh, a 20,000 unit program per year is big for them. Then they saw the, the, the reservation number, like over 30,000 or something. And uh, they were like, oh, maybe we can raise that up to 40,000 units per year. Uh, that'd be hard in my opinion <laughs> but I, I i still think it will sell well and they're gonna have cheaper version coming out and then a bunch of people i think are gonna want that car just for the the look of it right it, it is a good looking car so if you can get it for i don't know just a rear-wheel drive version for ninety thousand dollars something like that i think that would sell out too you don't get those wheels though for on the low end right that those wheels will be coming behind yeah, I don't know. We we know nothing of the specs of the lower end version yet. That will probably come out next year. Uh, but yeah, uh, Porsche also today announced uh, the production date is going to officially start no- uh, September nine. So that's next week. <coughs> I'm sorry. And then when when is when do they anticipate first deliveries to be made? I would assume uh, it would be soon after uh, in Europe. Uh, but the car is not expected until early next year uh, in North America. So uh, it's going to be a while before we see it here. All right. So we just talked about how everyone is comparing it to uh, to the Tesla Model S. And if you look at just the specs, sure, the Model S looks like it's beating it everywhere. Uh, Porsche before the launch had been pushing this idea of sustainable power output uh, that they said that that's the weakness of Tesla. They, they specifically uh, pointed out Tesla on that front and they said that the, the um, Taken is going to beat Tesla on sustainable power output which means either multiple 0 to 60 launch consecutively. I don't know in what kind of situation you would do that but they said they could beat Tesla there. It seems uh, like a very, very, very edge case. Like, yeah, yeah. In the, in the, the, a, more, the track. a more useful case would be on the track, which that's more that's that's fair. Porsche drivers do sometimes bring their car to track. Less so for Tesla drivers, though there's some events now that like uh, this, sorry, Tesla Corsa and things like that that are coming up that might change that. On the Autobahn. So, of course, Porsche is a German company. They have a big market in Germany. And they have the Autobahn in Germany where you can push your car to its limit. So the Model S will, um, if you push it at the top speed for too long, will go into a low power mode and uh, will will limit the power output. Uh, And of course, the efficiency goes down. But I think think the Porsche taking the efficiency will also go down a lot in in high speed. So that's that's more not really the idea. 
I assume the idea is that you could get that 162 mile per hour tire speed for a longer, um, uh, an extended period of time without the car going into lower power mode. Their claim to that, why they were so good, well, an example of it that they wanted to show was the Nurburgring track that they, they did a, they claim uh, that was a week or two ago, they claimed the fastest four door electric sports car. It's a pretty specific type of yeah. <laughs> record to get on the Nurburgring track. Uh, but that time was seven minutes forty two seconds, which is a pretty good time, regardless of that. How specific is that record? Because that record, I mean, there's not that many cars available today that would uh, be considered a, a four door electric sports car. Uh, Tesla Model S and Model Three would fit that description, though not necessarily a sports car, but whatever. Yeah, and Porsche, you know, Porsche makes a couple couple other, like the Panamera or whatever. Yeah. Four, four door Porsche. All electric, though. They did say also all electric. Right. So, Elon, yesterday, he made a few comments about the Porsche, like laughing at them about uh, the fact that they are calling their car turbo and it's an electric car. But right after that, he did say that uh, he's going to bring them all S to the Nurburgring racetrack next week. So, he didn't outright say that it's going to. Is to beat Porsche new record, but the timing of it sounds like it's clear. That's that's what he wants. He wants to do. Um, we've never seen. Uh, we've seen a bunch of Model S on the neighboring track, but I don't think we've never seen like someone actually trying to do like a fastest time. Especially since uh, you know, in, in driving days, sometimes the, the track is quite busy. Also, not necessarily a pro driver. Porsche, of course, utilized the pro driver for that record. And um, we certainly haven't seen a new Model S with the the new Raven motor. Right. That's it. What's interesting because the Raven motor is supposed to be more efficient. Theoretically, maybe it uses uh, less battery. Less battery means that um, you know the, the overheating would be less. And you know, Tesla could make a a track version of the Model S with you know extra cooling theoretically, or well, a track mode really. Yeah, and I mean, you can do other stuff like uh, freeze the batteries beforehand or, or cool off the batteries, you know, with dry ice or something. I mean, there's there's lots of tricks to do. I don't know if that's something Tesla was gonna was thinking about, but uh, we, we even got a tip that uh, Tesla may, or well, it was just speculation, but like what if Tesla was doing the Nuremberg ring without a driver, you know, with like a either a remote or you know, on autopilot. I think that's probably a little crazy, but yeah, that would require, require a lot of testing. Like, yeah, you yeah. Have to do it a bunch of times to really get that perfect time. But, right. uh, yeah. Also, you know, says that next week, but, uh, Nurburgring apparently said that there is no track time available for a record attempt, attempt until the rest of the season. So that, that seems like something that, you, you know, the right amount of money and talking to the right people could get you. Through. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, early morning, late, late in the night, whatever. Like somebody, you just, you can handle it. Yeah. Wouldn't be surprising really. But also would be surprising if you don't talk too fast. <laughs> yes. It also yeah. wouldn't be surprising at all. All right. Moving on. Well, moving on. Do you think, do you think the MLS can beat the, the Titan's time? I don't think uh, stock is prepared to do that. And I just think that Tesla didn't build the type of cooling system for the batteries that the Nuremberg Ring, the Nuremberg Ring requires because nobody's doing that. Like maybe on the Autobahn, people are driving like that, but for the most part, people aren't driving in such a way that you would need the type of cooling that the, the ring requires. Yeah, but because for people who don't know, like the Nürburgring track is like a 20 kilometer long track and it allows for a lot of um, of high speed, basically. Like it, it, there's a lot of turns, of course, too, but there's a lot of stretch where you can drive really fast for, for a relatively long period of time. So, I mean, you do complete a 20 kilometer long track in seven minutes. So it is pretty fast. Yeah. So, you know, the question does I, I don't think a stock Model S uh, could be that time, but 
I also think there's a lot of things that you can do to a Model S that Tesla, you know, clearly has some R&D going on in that field. So maybe they bring out a, a special Model S uh, with, you know, better cooling, maybe, you know, super high output, maybe, you know, whatever. But um, I think Tesla can build a car that would beat that. I mean, I, I'd be interested to see what that Roadster uh, would do on the, the ring. Yeah, the Roadster would probably be the But I think also among the last ribbon could probably beat the time, not by a lot or get at least very close to it. So it wouldn't be like that big and uh, impressive, but it would be like a slap in the face of a, a, a Porsche after they've been like, after they already got a slap in the face on the specs on paper. And now the only thing right. that they really had over Tesla, like, the, like nope, you don't have that either. Um, I mean, they, they had a few other things, like the, they, they did like the zero to ninety to zero that they claim is faster. But uh, I mean, I would have to assume that Porsche actually did those all those tests also with the Model S first to uh, right. We to, know to that make Porsche sure that, bought, <laughs> bought a Model S to make sure that. Well, they bought a few of them too. Right, we've seen we're them. Uh, we've seen them testing them. All right, moving along, moving along, moving along, moving along, moving along, or moving yeah. on. <laughs> um, Tesla battery cell manufacturing. We've been talking about that for a few months now, especially since the shareholders meeting, where uh, where JB, uh, Drew Baglino, and uh, and Elon were all talking about about it, and they all but confirmed really that uh, they plan to Tesla plans to build its own battery cells in the near future. This week, we published a report uh, based on some job listing from Tesla. And one of those job listing job listing was for a cell manufacturing job, a, a manufacturing technician in a cell manufacturing team. And the in the job listing, Tesla writes, Tesla is currently seeking a technician for a manufacturing line we are developing. You'll be part of a new product line we are developing. And it lists a bunch of uh, responsibility related to battery cell manufacturing. Which leads us to believe that Tesla is ending building a new manufacturing line for battery cell, and that job listing is for Fremont, California, too. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a Fremont factory. Tesla has a bunch of other locations in Fremont, but Tesla is building a battery cell manufacturing line in Fremont. So that's interesting. And another um, listing for a cell technician was more related to the R&D uh, manufacturing of cells prototype, battery cell prototype. But what was particularly interesting about this listing is that it was for Bl- uh, Broom, Broomfield, Colorado. And Tesla doesn't officially have any location in Broomfield, Colorado. Um, and it looks clearly that they w- were working here on in the battery lab. Like we're talking about the job uh in the job listing, this is like 90% of the responsibility is about making uh, electrode prototypes and battery cell prototypes. So very much a battery lab that Tesla would have in Colorado. Uh, some digging might uh, appear that uh, it, it might be related to the acquisition of Maxwell. Uh, Maxwell had a relationship with the University of Denver. And uh, Broomfield is uh, sort of a suburb of Denver. So that might be it. I don't know, Seth, you had another theory, too? I don't know yeah, I mean, we, yet. we had a uh, uh, a very reliable source who gave us good information in the past tell us that uh, previous to Maxwell, uh, Tesla had been doing some uh, partnership research uh, with a, uh, with the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, a lab there, uh, which eventually turned into a company called um, Solid... Solid, Solid power, power, yeah, yeah, and um, the the kind of the lab grew out of the University of uh, Colorado at Boulder, and now it's nearby, um, very close to where the job uh, description was, um, and they they're doing um, solid state battery stuff. Um, so, and you know, just kind of doing some back research on it. Um, they're doing, you know, there was a, an article about them that said they were doing solid state battery uh, that could double the range of electric cars. Um, so it might be, this might be 
you know, kind of like uh, what's his name, Jeff Dom Dom's lab in uh, Halifax. Halifax. Maybe this is one of their kind of external research labs where they um, kind of really like really far out technologies. They kind of develop that stuff and bring it into more of the mainstream. Um, that's kind of what I was thinking this is about. But the fact that it's actually a Tesla job makes me think that there might be more to it than that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're, we're digging. We'll, we'll figure out uh, what's going on over there. Yeah. But the other job in Fremont more clearly states that uh, Tesla is working on the manufacturing line for battery, battery cells in California. So that's good news. So why are they doing that in California and not in Nevada? Because the battery cell production in Nevada is uh, Panasonic's territory. In, in, in Gigafactory 1, I mean. Okay, so they're doing it so they can do it by themselves or yep. with Maxwell. Yep. Um, and Panasonic is owns all the, the Giga, you know, any batteries that are made in Nevada. Yeah, Tesla has a deal that the batteries made at Nevada, Gigafactory 1, are made by Panasonic and right. sold to Tesla. All right. Do we have any vegan vegan listeners? Uh, you can get now a Model 3 completely vegan interior, letter free. Uh, Tesla announced that this weekend. And then uh, through uh, Lenani Munter, who's a longtime test owner, uh, EV advocate, and race car driver too, who happens to be vegan, she confirmed this week that Tesla actually offers retrofits for the... Because, uh, yeah, I should back up a little bit. I should back up. The main thing that wasn't vegan in the Model 3 was the steering wheel because uh, the rest was already pretty much vegan. Of course, Tesla, uh, pre-Model 3, I think. Yeah, pre-Model 3, Tesla changed all the ceiling, all the interior option to this synthetic uh, leather thing that they developed it that's not uh, real leather. So that was already done. Though they always kept the same. Uh, well, for the Model S and X, they were using like this Mercedes-Benz steering wheel. That was leather, though they did uh, have like a custom option, like an off the menu item that you could order. That was uh, that was non leather, so you could get the interior of a Model S or X vegan. You couldn't do that with the Model Three because the Model Three was a different steering wheel that I think Tesla makes themselves. Pretty sure Tesla makes themselves. Anyway, now they made a vegan option. And it's not only for new cars, like, but it is now. All new cars are made with that. But you can also get a retrofit for a six hundred bucks, which I'm not sure why you would do really, because the dime right. is already done. Like, <laughs> right. the old steering you, wheel, the is, cow's already dead. And, and I mean, I assume you keep your wheel too. Like, it, it's a new. St- it's not because it's damaged or anything. Like, so it's like you still have the wheel, so you have to like to sell the other one or donate it or, or, or whatever. I Do you think so. it's a new wheel, or they just like rip off the stitches and put on new? Well, for six hundred bucks, I hope it's a new wheel, right? <laughs> because that's not uh, that's expensive. Yeah, I mean, I guess some, some people are kind of grossed out by the fact that you're holding animal skin, so maybe not. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but uh, Lenani did give her an explanation for it. She said, and I quote, I understand the cow does not does not come back to life. Okay, good point. However, eight years ago when I went vegan, I donated all leather, all leather items, shoes, etc. I don't want anything made from animals. I don't expect everyone to make this choice. But for me, it was really important ethically. I love my Tesla and love animals. That's fair. Yep. All right, this morning we posted a new <coughs> sorry, a new patent application for Tesla. And I mean, Tesla is a pretty high-tech company. They apply for patents all the time. So most of it is like related to batteries, related to uh, autonomous driving, related to solar cells, related to like very high-tech stuff. This time is for wipers, a new wiper patent, but not just any kind of wiper, an electromagnetic wiper. Looks pretty cool. We well, we we don't we, we don't never we have never seen it, but we've seen some drawing of the system, and it basically consists of like a block of magnets that sits um, underneath the hood of the car, L- like a lot of uh, of wipers these days, because um, 
people don't want to see wipers anymore. Wipers are not cool anymore. They're house set. So I hope you don't show your wipers. They are hidden now underneath um, the hood of the car, but they deploy a little bit when they go out. And I, I you've seen mostly on luxury vehicles, but now I feel like it's going to a lot of different vehicles too. Uh, the Model 3s are pretty hidden. Model S too. X too, of course. Like Tesla's already doing that a lot, but it's more complex. The Bolt, is the Bolt uh, what person? said? No, the Bolt, I think you see them. Yeah, Remember? I mean, they're, they're kind of they're kind of buried in a little bit. The Bolt, I think, one of my cars is weird because one of the wipers is very small. Um, and then the other wiper is big. I can't remember if that's the Bolt or the Model X. Hmm. But anyway. Anyway, this one, it's it would be easier to hide it because of that, because it's just one wiper that just deploys straight up. And when it deploys, it's also, since it's just one wiper and it can, it, it's not fixed, it travels all around that block of magnetic, uh, electromagnetic magnet, uh, you just have, you just need like one perfect curve that follows the curve of the of the windshield. Since it doesn't go up and down on the windshield, it just go left and right. Um, you you can have it match perfectly the curve of the windshield, so it cleans better. It's easier to hide. And uh, in the patent, Tesla also argues that it consumes less energy. So that's something, that's something that I thought about, but uh, apparently, um, mechanical parts. Uh, and the friction in a, a regular conventional wiper consumes a lot of energy. I'd like to know the percentage of it, but is it the, the, in the patent application, they literally say it reduced the range. So they think their electromagnetic wiper is going to be more efficient and uh, it will also break less, they think. Huh. So something to keep in mind, of course, is when the, a company applies for a patent, doesn't mean that they necessarily think about well, they do think about it, but not necessarily that it will ever come to production. However, I did a little more digging on this, and I, I looked into uh, all the... There's three inventors listed uh, on this patent, three Tesla engineers, Materia Kedambari, Gonzalo Espinosa Graham, and Nicola Cliff. And all those people are uh, in their, their profile, in their LinkedIn profile. They are all mechanical engineers. And... They list uh, designing, developing, and validating exterior electromechanical system for Tesla vehicles. And one of them, Graham, specifically says that they are developing systems uh, to be introduced in Model S, X, and 3. So I don't know. Maybe they will actually uh, uh, deploy that in Tesla vehicles. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, this is something that uh, they could definitely use. It's not like that far out there. Mm-hmm. All right, the F-150 electric pickup truck. Uh, Ford has been talking a little bit more about it lately. Uh, they unveiled a prototype a few a few weeks ago with their whole million-pound towing of a train uh, train wagons. This week, what they're doing is um, they launched uh, this type of like... Um, well, actually, that's not from that. Sorry, <laughs> I'm confusing two things. Uh, now, this week in an interview with Otokar for the Steam Edison leader, like they made like this uh, little team that works on uh, uh, on electric vehicles at Ford, and they call it Team Edison. Darren Palmer, he confirmed that the F-150 is planned for before 2022. So when they unveiled that prototype a few weeks ago, they were still saying like uh, in the coming years, they've always been um, unclear with the, 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 the timeline. There was never a clear timeline. Now it's before 2022. So I would assume 2021, which should place it uh, around the same time as uh, the Tesla pickup truck. And Rivian. Uh, Rivian is supposed to be end of 2021, uh, 2020. Yeah. Uh, Wouldn't yeah. be too surprising if it slips uh, to 2021. Right. Uh, yeah. The other thing I wanted to say about Ford is the Mustang inspired, inspired electric crossover. Oh, that thing is ugly. That thing is covered in camouflage set, given right. a chance. I know, there's but that's so that much front grill looks just absurd. Yeah, because there's like two type of camouflage on top of it. So right. you, cannot, you cannot base anything on this. But they did share some uh, pictures of it testing. And what I was going to say to earlier is that 
they did release this like Miss uh, Evie Mid Buster type of uh, YouTube series and um, a blog post too, where they uh, they try to show like um, some old myth about EVs where you cannot use them on the winter and stuff like that. And so to to to, to dispel that, they um, they released some footage of uh, them doing some winter testing for the upcoming um, Mustang inspired crossover. That's going to be the very first all electric car from for- well not. Well, there's a Ford uh, Focus EV and whatnot, but the first non-conversion EV from from, from Ford, like a, mm. a vehicle on a new platform meant to be electric from the ground up. And yet, uh, to your point, Seth, we don't get to see much more than uh, the form factor, size. It looks like a small SUV or crossover type deal. But yeah, any type of um, you could see that the hood is quite aggressive. It's short, and uh, there's wide difference between the hood and the fenders. <coughs> but yeah, it's covered in camouflage, so and not much to see than that. All right, available use gonna start offering electric conversion for classic Beetles and maybe other cars too. Uh, next week at the Frankfurt Auto Show, they're going to unveil their first prototype of an old Beetle with uh, basically with the new e up powertrain inside. So the e up has a new powertrain with a 36.8 kilowatt hour battery pack. They say that that's good enough for, well, n- not for the e up, but in a converted Beetle, it's up, it's good for 200 kilometers of uh, range, which is, it, it's, it's not bad for an EV conversion. Like you exactly. don't. Uh, yeah, it's an EV conversion, guys. So you, you cannot expect that much range. And a 36 wing with our batch pack fitted into like a, the prototype appears to be like a two door convertible Beetle from the 60s, I guess. I don't know. I'm not that good at that. Like, uh, I've never been like the biggest fan of the Beetle. Yeah, maybe so, 70s. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know about the ground effect. There's there's definitely some some other things being done to this car. Mm hmm. But uh, you know the Beetle's actually a pretty good car to to convert anyway. Like I think quite a few people have done this. Um, just generally speaking, uh, the Beetle and and also the uh, the VW vans, mm-hmm. uh, or the mini buses. Um, and they do uh, list the mini buses as a potential future one to uh, to convert. But the idea of it, you're you're right. Other people have done it, but they've done it like in one offs uh, type of deal. Or right. if they do offer uh, it as a service, it's extremely expensive. It's not really streamlined. The idea here is that VW could streamline it by uh, they, they are literally using existing part that they make for the EOP, so that that's easy there. And then they partner up with a company called E Classics in uh, uh, near near Stuttgart. So there, there there's way to streamline things and make probably uh, reduce cost a little bit. But they, they didn't confirm a price for it, but we are hearing something like $60,000 or something like that, so it's still not cheap. Insane. So, it, Yeah, so it, it is really if um, you have a classic VW and you really want it to be electric, I feel like uh, maybe some I mean, they can companies make new, can do it they cheaper. Can make, I wouldn't be surprised. They could make a new Beetle for 60000 Yeah. But at the same time, like um, a company like uh, we would often will we'll use like Savile sal- salvage battery packs, battery modules, and things like right. that. So you, you do get new components there. So that's that's a positive. Uh, yeah. So again, they said the bus. They might do the bus. They might also do a Porsche uh, three fifty six. Yeah. All right. But what we're really looking forward to f- from Volkswagen is the ID three. That's supposed to be the car that changed everything for Volkswagen going electric with the new, the first car on the EMEV platform. That's going to be a platform that's uh, uh, on which VW expect to make millions of electric vehicles per year over the next, uh, well, by 2025, really. Uh, now, I did post this article earlier this morning, and I just got confirmation from VW about uh, about that. So uh, we're gonna update that. I'll make a new, one. Might maybe make a new article because I think that's <laughs> that kind of buried the lead here. 
they announced today that they build 400 ID3s car and volume production should start in November. So they are preparing. Uh, the big deal here is, of course, sorry, is, of course, uh, Zyko. That's a uh, plant in Germany where they are currently producing 300,000 gasoline cars per year. And they are converting that to all electric production and starting with the ID3. So, however, in that post today, in that, that press release that they sent about uh, starting production for the ID3, because the ID3 is going to be the production version is going to be unveiled next week. So, next week, we see the car, the production version. Then, November production starts. But then I saw in the post that they said, they, they say the first deliveries are planned for the summer of 2020. That's crazy. That's like a year from now. Yeah. So now, now I'm like, whoa, is that the, the, the someone made a mistake in the press release or something? That makes no sense. Start, number, start production in November, summer 2020. Like, so that, that's like six, seven months at least between start of production and start of deliveries. So I reached out to VW and VW were like, no, we, we said that before. Like, you missed it. Like, I'm, yeah, I missed it because that's a big deal. So I'm like, I asked like, what's, what's happening during the seven, those seven months? And they said that they are well. They, they, they said there's a complexity to switching from gasoline production to electric car production. I'm like, okay, that that's fair, but then why are you saying you're starting production in November? And then they say we we will start production in November, but we're gonna accumulate volume. They want to accumulate volume through the summer of 2020 and then start deliveries. That's that's a weird statement to me. Yep. It is. I mean, I mean, no car company wants to accumulate volume. Like mm-hmm. inventory is not a good thing to have. If if somebody wants to buy a car and they're they're just accumulating volume, like that's a, that's a really mm-hmm. stupid decision. I think they have thirty thousand reservation for it, right? And they they said that they are in the same statement. They said they were still committed to producing hundred thousand ID three next years in twenty twenty. So that means. Like if on average, like the first six months, there's like fifty thousand cars going to be sitting on. Really? You yeah. Know, you want to know my guess? Yeah. Won't be the batteries in a lot of those cars are going to be produced there. A lot yep. of that volume. Yep. Batteries the battery. going to be need, need to be added later. Uh, that is a good guess. I think that's probably the problem. Yeah. So it's something. It's a, a new story that we're going to keep an eye on because I was I was really surprised by. I, I'm going through Europe at the end of the year. We're spending a few months in Europe. And I was planning to see, like, I, there's a few cars I want to see in Europe, while in Europe that want to test drive. The Taken was one of them. I knew the Taken's not going to be in the U.S. until next year. So I'm like, oh, maybe I can get a seat in it if I go to Europe. I wanted I wanted to try the new Honda E. Uh, uh, Honda e. I wanted, like, a few of those cars that are only going to be in Europe. And the ID3 was on top of my list. But now I'm like, I won't be able to sit in that until next year. That's crazy. Well, you, you could sit in one, but... The- Car won't have a battery, probably. Yeah, all right. I mean, I'm sure they're gonna make a few too. Like they already have 400 of them. Maybe they can uh, make me sit in those. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, they gave test drives to people. Yeah, they did. The European press in South Africa, like mm-hmm. that was like a few months ago. So between that and well, they did say they produced 400 of them. I'm just saying that probably they don't have the battery volume that match with it. Like uh, right, or maybe anyway, they they thought they did and maybe the price went up or i think lg's their their partner lg mm-hmm. said well we can't mm-hmm. get it till summer or something like that yeah maybe anyway we'll keep an eye on that so thanks a lot for listening everyone we're gonna see you next time same place next week ciao